symmetries of the tensor to um, to topological order. So basically, the basic question is: given a local tensor, out of which we build a tensor network state, and so on, how are the properties of the global state related to the local tensor? So what what does a local tensor tell us about the global state? Um, so that would be the general theme of the talk. Um, that's a question we've been working on since a long time with Ignacio, David, with Frank, and a number of other people. Um, so, so the aim of this talk is that I, I, I would like to try, uh, I, I want to try to convince you why we're very excited about how certain properties of the local tensor allow us to explain a lot of different things about the global state. If there's time at the end, I will try to make a connection also to chiral phases. So that's very recent work. So Torsten has a poster on that, actually. Um, so I encourage you to go there, where we find that very similar properties also show up in chiral phases, which seem to be intimately related with the fact that these models are chiral. Um, and well, that's one, one reason why we're very excited about discovering these symmetries, because in the non-chiral case, very similar symmetries have allowed us to explain a lot of different properties of the, of the system. Um, OK, so feel free to interrupt me. Um, I mean, I have a couple of notes, but I'm happy to deviate from the notes. So last time when I talked here in the Wednesday meeting, uh, I made it through the first three lines of my uh, notes. But I mean, that's Can certainly fine for me. <laughs> 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 no, <laughs> it works. <laughs> um, OK. Um, OK, so my, my, in my talk, I will consider two-dimensional tensor networks. I will generally look at a square lattice. So I will typically denote the tensor just by, well, a bubble with five legs, right? So we have some auxiliary legs, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and some physical leg, right? So we have some tensor A, I alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And where we just use a standard notation, right? Whenever we connect legs of tensor, it means that we identify the corresponding index and we sum over that index. And well, these tensor networks, we can put them on various geometries. So what I will consider is either on a torus, Or I will also consider states on a cylinder. So where I put this network onto a cylinder. Now in the case of a cylinder, there are various possibilities. So I could put this state on a cylinder and choose to terminate the open links at the boundary in some way. But typically, I would rather consider the case in which there are open links at the boundary when I talk about a cylinder, which basically means what I did is I took a tensor network, which I put on a torus, where there are links kind of going all around. And I chopped it into two pieces, say. So there are links sticking out, which kind of tell me how I have to entangle this cylinder with kind of the other half of the torus to, to just glue the whole torus together again. Mm. OK, so, so what I'm interested in is, is mostly um, models where I can write, so basically solvable models, so models where I can just write down a tensor. Right, so tensor networks can be used for many different things. They can be used for numerics. They can be used to, to build solvable models. So we are more interested here in the solvable model aspect. Which basically means that we have an ansatz wave. And well, the idea is indeed that we kind of start from a tensor. And this tensor, on the one hand, allows us to construct a wave function. So let's call this psi. Um, but on the other hand, the same kind of notation, the, the same tensor also allows us, in fact, to construct a Hamiltonian. Which has well, which is a sum of local terms, and which has this wave fun function as its exact ground state. So, in that sense, one could think of this tensor as really being like like a central object, rather than starting from a Hamiltonian and then studying the ground state. We can, as well, start from a tensor and simultaneously obtain a Hamiltonian and the ground state, which we can study. And so, how is this Hamiltonian obtained? Just to give a brief sketch. So, please feel free to interrupt if you want more details, right? I'm trying to be a bit sketchy and kind of cover various topics, but if you feel you want to know more details, please let me know, right? Um, so, the idea is that if we, if we take such a tensor network state and we, we cut a region out of that state, <coughs> some more colors. So if we cut some region out of the state, we, we look at the reduced state on, say, these four sides. What we see is that the reduced density operator, well, must be of the, of the following form, right? It must be given by a small tensor network where we have physical indices 
and we just put an arbitrary boundary condition on these legs here because we don't really know what the environment will do if we just look at the reduced density operator. And the thing is that what we see is that, well, the degrees of freedom on which this reduced operator live, they scale like the volume, right? So if the physical dimension is small d, these will scale like d to the L times L, right? Which is the volume, if that's a block of, of length L here, like L is two in this case. And the boundary degrees of freedom scale like some capital D, which is just a property of the tensor, right? These are fixed, fixed numbers. This case like D to the four times L, right? The circumference. So we can see if we choose our block L sufficiently large, it will always happen at some point that this number is larger than that number, which means that the state does not occupy, the reduced density operator does not occupy the full space. So we can always use this to write an operator, small h, which is one minus the projector onto the support of rho, which means that, well, any state which is cut out of such a tensor network will have energy zero, whereas there will be other states which have energy higher than zero. At least there should be some, right, because this doesn't have full rank, so this is not a trivial operator. And then we can build this parent Hamiltonian up here. And indeed, one relevant question is, under which conditions will such models, say, be unique ground states or ground states with a con controlled degeneracy of the corresponding parent Hamiltonian? Right? Otherwise, this framework would be pretty useless if this Hamiltonian has a huge ground space degeneracy, which we cannot control. Right? We want a controlled behavior of the ground space of this Hamiltonian. OK, so, so, so in this talk, I would, would like to highlight which properties this tensor needs to have in order to obtain systems of this topological order with a ground state degeneracy, which depends on, well, the, the topology of the, um, the manifold on which we put it. So say where it's not unique on the torus, but it depends kind of on some properties of the model. Um, but for this, maybe let me first introduce what topologically ordered states are for those who don't know. Are there questions concerning the general tensor network language? I was kind of short, I assume, that given it's a tensor network conference. Also, there are some non-tensor network people here, I guess. Yeah. Actually, is it possible to construct the Hamiltonian without uh, constructing the ground states? Mm, well, I mean, yeah. indeed. Well, in some sense, that's what I do, right? I just look at, at a small patch of tensors. Right? I, I mean, you don't have to go via this state, via a big state, and then look at the reduced state. Indeed, that's what you're not doing. I mean, if I would construct a global state, I would have to actually trace and see what, what the boundary condition is I get by tracing. But I, I, I don't do that, right? I just assume any possible boundary conditions. And it could be that due to the structure of the state, there are certain boundary conditions which cannot even occur. So indeed, in some sense, the semitone is not constructed by taking the global state and looking at reduced density operators, but by just looking at the form of this tensor and asking for what reduced density operators does it allow. So in some sense, it's, it's really a local construction. And I mean, you, you can come up with examples where this does indeed make a difference. I'm sorry, if what? Well, that's indeed an, an in interesting and also difficult question. And so, so indeed, then one aim of this talk is to give conditions under which we know that the ground state degeneracy is controlled. And it will turn out this has a number of, I mean, this condition has a number of, of additional consequences, like anionic excitations, um, protection of edge physics, and so on. So. But indeed, the original aim when we did this was indeed to answer exactly that question, to figure out um, what are the conditions such that we have a topological degeneracy. Mm. OK, so any more questions? OK, so. So what is topological order? Well, the, the basic idea of topological order is that, well, I guess there are different ways to define topological order, so I just choose one. And I, I will basically stick to one example, the Tori code, which is kind of the simplest example and uses to illustrate the basic ideas. But I mean, it's, these, these things work for more general examples. It's just that it's, it's easier to you know, present it for a simple example. So we have the Hamiltonian, and it should have some degenerate ground space. 
which depends on the topology. And it might also have excitation, which have an interesting statistics, which are anionic. Which means that, you know, if you, you cannot create them individually. You have to create them in pairs. If you move them around each other, you get interesting phases or even non abelian behavior. Um, and well, then there are other ways to define topological order, starting from the ground state. For instance, asking if I take some state or just from a state, which, well, we say is a ground state. So given some state on some lattice, we can cut some region A out of the lattice and ask for the entanglement properties of that region A, right? And for instance, we can ask for the entanglement entropy of this reduced state, so the entropy of the reduced state of A, which quantifies the entanglement. And well, typically we expect for systems which, which have some translational symmetry and which are ground state that the entanglement scales like the boundary. So it will be proportional to the boundary of that region. But in topological systems, there's a correction, which is, which is kind of independent of the shape of this region A. It just, well, once, once you subtract the linear part, you will get something like that. <coughs> or the, the states can also have non-trivial trans, non transformation properties. Say if we rotate the state or well, tilt the state or something like that, it will behave in a way which we don't expect for, for a simple state to, um, to exhibit. But okay, so so there are various ways to characterize these things, and we will kind of see all these phenomena later once we, once we have this characterization here. But let's just start from a simple example. So that's the toric code state. So that's kind of the simplest topological model, I guess, one can write down. And the idea is that we look at a model which, is, which lives on a square lattice. Um, and we have, we have spins which sit on the edges of the lattice. So there's a spin on every edge. And now we want to look at, at a state. Well, we, now I will mark an edge red if that spin isn't in state one, right? It's a qubit, so it can be zero or one. I will mark the ones. And I want, I want to consider states where these ones form loops, where these ones form closed loops, like here. And now I want to consider a state which is of the form that it's a uniform superposition over all possible loop patterns. So I will occasionally omit the lattice because the lattice is not that important in the end. So this should be a uniform weight superposition of really all possible loop patterns of that form. And well, it turns out that one can find a Hamiltonian for that. I will not give it explicitly. But the idea is that the Hamiltonian have sh should have two types of terms. It should have one term which, <coughs> which gives an energy penalty if they are non-closed loops. So if the number of ones adjacent to a certain edge is not even. And it should have a second term which is kind of a resonance term, which says that I, if I have a loop, I can change it, for instance, by flipping this part of the loop here and deform it into a different loop. And this way, I will enforce that these loops appear with, with equal weight whenever they can be deformed by such a, a move. And certainly, if I, if I put this on whatever rectangular area, if I don't care about boundary conditions, any loop pattern can be deformed into any other loop pattern that way by, by doing local updates. Now, it turns out that this model indeed has, if I, if I think about the Hamiltonian of that form, it has different ground state sectors if I put it on a non-trivial geometry, say on a torus, and how can I see that? Well, if, if we have this model on a torus, let's consider two possible kind of initial state, and then we try to ask, if I want this loop pattern to be contained, what should be the corresponding ground state given the, the way the Hamiltonian acts? And one could be a state where I have a loop going around the torus, and one could be where I have no loop going around the torus. Now you see, well, this, this just enforces loop constraints. So this is the interesting term because it kind of tries to change loop patterns. But all this can do is it can create new loop patterns and indeed, I can continue like that, right? So I, I can try to go around the torus. I can come back here. 
But you see, the last step will actually create two loops, not one. So these kind of loops, these kind of, of moves will never be able to create a single loop. They can only create pairs of loops. So the parity of loops across this cut and equally the parity of loops along this cut here is an invariant, right? It cannot be changed by such a Hamiltonian. So there are indeed different ground state sectors and they're characterized by the parity of loops going around the torus in the two directions. So there are four different ground states. And it's also kind of straightforward to see that this model should indeed have this topological correction to the entropy, because if you cut any region, you can ask how many of these strings of these closed lines will I cut? And because these four closed lines, the number of lines I cut always has to be even. So there's basically a, a constraint, a Z2 type of constraint. So in a logarithmic way, like in the entropy, this should exactly lead to a correction of one or LN2 or whatever. Okay, any questions? Okay, so, so how can I represent this model as a tensor network state? Mm. So for this I will rotate my lattice by 45 degrees, but the basic arguments I gave are not, don't really depend how my lattice is oriented. So I will look at a rotated lattice. Um, so we have this lattice here. Let me see if I get this done nicely. And well, there are some kind of loop patterns on this lattice, right? something like this, and these loops go on, and whatever. And now what I, what I will do is I, I will redraw this lattice by decorating the edges in such a way that, that I will insert horizontal or vertical lines, and then just redraw the same pattern. So basically here I insert horizontal lines, and here vertical lines, and so on. Let me see, so if I try to redraw the same figure, let me see if this works out. <coughs> this should look roughly like this. Um, there's nothing here, right? Right, so that's basically the same figure as before, just that I inserted some horizontal lines here and vertical lines here and so on. So I can draw the same kind of loop pattern on, on this lattice, but I still say there are only spins here, right? This is just a way to graphically depict the thing in a slightly different way, because what I can do now is that I can, I can, I can cut some blocks out of this lattice like this, and this will be my, these will be my tensors now, right? So I take each of these, these purple blocks and say, okay, I build a tensor which, well, has these legs here. Let's take this guy here. Oops. Let's look at that one. So I put these legs here like this. And then what I have is something like that, okay? So I have spins sitting here, here, and here. So these spins are in the one state. There's a fourth physical spin sitting here, which is in the zero state. So that's, that's the physical part of my tensor, and then it has auxiliary indices going in all, pos in all, all four directions. And again, whenever I have a red line, I put a one here, and otherwise I put a zero. Is that picture clear? So it's kind of just a way to cut a piece of these strings and say whenever a string is, is going into one of these elementary plaquettes, I put a one and when there's no string, I put a zero. Um, and the thing is every string pattern in, in the inside has a unique way at the outside, right? Because the strings must be closed. Now, there, there are two observations. So if I define my tensor as follows, what has to hold is because these guys form closed loops is that whenever a loop is entering, it also has to leave, right? which means that I have a parity constraint on this guy. On the boundary. Right, so if I, if I draw the tensor in the way I usually draw tensors, like this. So these are the four boundaries, and this is this, is this big physical system here. Then what I have is that I can take this tensor and I know that it has to live in the even parity subspace. 
which means that I can act with some symmetry operation on it. Oops. Which in this case is just a Pauli Z. And it will stay invariant because it's in the even parity subspace. Um, and well, the second important thing is that within this even parity subspace, so, so this symmetry is like one condition, and this will be kind of the basic condition I will look at. But typically, what is important is that the symmetry kind of fully specifies the support of the tensor, which means that whenever I am in the, in the even parity subspace, by looking at the physical configuration, I can infer this configuration. So there's no additional ambiguity. One could live with additional ambiguity, but it, it can cause trouble. It can cause additional degeneracies. So we generally want to consider the case where this, this symmetry fully specifies the support of this tensor on the auxiliary degrees of freedom. Fully specifies. Okay, so this property is what we what we term G injective. So injective because if, 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 if there wouldn't be a symmetry, the condition would be that this tensor doesn't have any symmetries. It would mean that if I look at the map from the auxiliary degrees to the physical system, the map is injective. It maps different boundary conditions. It doesn't have a kernel, right? That's what injective means. G injective because there's a symmetry group. So in that case, I would probably call it Z2 injective. So actually, in one of these days, Yuta will talk about a generalization of this concept to a much larger class of models. Um, but I, I will really f uh, focus on this one. And well, it turns out that the symmetry, together with this injectivity condition, allows us to prove a lot of different conditions on topological order, on the type of order in the system. So you spontaneously making this symmetry transformation on the physical and auxiliary spaces? No, no, I'm not doing a transformation on the physical space. That's, that, that's very important. It's kind of a hidden symmetry. You could call it a gauge symmetry. Also, I'm, I'm a bit careful with calling it a gauge symmetry. But it's kind of a, a hidden symmetry in the representation. So it, it basically tells you that this tensor is only, I mean, it, I think we'll see later, it relates to a lot of things. You can already see in this small picture, it kind of relates to this topological correction. Because as I said, this correction comes from the fact that whenever I call a, a cut a region, the number of strings crossing the boundary is even. And this condition is, of course, the kind of smallest elementary version of exactly that statement, that the number of strings crossing the boundary is even. But there's, there's no physical symmetry associated to it. So this would be very different, right? If a, a physical symmetry action would translate to such a symmetry action, it would mean that the state has actually a symmetry, in the sense that you know I, I transform the state under a unitary tensor n, and it's invariant. Some models you have to make small changes to the same transformation on the physical and auxiliary. Sorry. Some cases you make physical and auxiliary mm -hmm. the same transformation. I mean, this case exists, but that's that's not what I'm interested in. And it's and it's it's, it's a discrete symmetry, right? I mean, with a continuous symmetry, this would basically just just probably completely kill the whole tensor. And especially, you couldn't have an, a lot of nice properties. So we really focus on finite symmetry groups. So I will really just use Z2, but you could indeed use any symmetry group as long as your representation has some reasonable properties, like having all ellipse. OK, so, um, so I, will, I will not really do proofs. I will try to illustrate why the symmetry gives rise to all these topological features. And if, you, if you want to have proofs, let me know, but probably I will not give the whole proof anyway. Um, so the idea is really to more like pictorially try to illustrate why these things are important. So I should also say that very recently we have discovered a very similar flavor symmetry with very similar properties in, in these carrot fermionic states, which therefore, well, we already found they give rise to some, some very related properties, and we hope that they give also rise to some other properties, which we expect to be there. So. So what is important about the symmetry? Well, a, a very elementary property which is important is that it concatenates nicely. Concatenation. So if I take two tensors and concatenate them, right, which I have to do if I draw a tensor network, you can very easily see that because each of the tensors is invariant under an action of Z, I put Z everywhere, and Z on the second tensor, these z's here cancel out. So what I find is that the joint tensor is also invariant. And I mean, obviously, this, this, this keeps going on like that if I grow and grow my system. In fact, it turns out that the whole injectivity property, namely that 
there is no additional kernel in the whole thing, also carries over. But that's kind of the important idea. The symmetry is stable. That's, that's a very important defining property of such a symmetry. You want something which you can concatenate, and you have the same property on larger scales, because otherwise it's not very useful to have something on a local scale which doesn't carry over to the global system. Mm. Okay, so, so what does this imply? So um, let's imagine we take, let me write a caption also, I give away the, okay, so, so let's imagine we, we take a big tensor network and I will just draw it from the top. I will not really draw the physical indices because they're not so important. So we just take a piece of a tensor network So there are physical indices sticking out, right, in our direction, and this thing lives on a torus or on whatever, it doesn't matter, I just look at a small patch. And the question is if I have a bunch of these strings sitting on one of, forming a string, forming a chain on one of these links, what can I say about them? So we have some string here. Now the string is only an imagined string, and what Yuto will explain, there will be actual strings, which have actual tensor indices themselves. But the idea is still to think of this as a string, it's like a, a, a line of these, a string of these. Well, we know that this tensor has a symmetry here, right? So it means that, in particular, if we have one z sitting here at the tensor, so now again, this is a top view. Oh, sorry. If we have this top view I have here, it means that I can take one z, and because the whole thing is invariant <coughs> and I'm putting z everywhere, I put it everywhere, it cancels up here. So in fact, it is a different way to write this equation is to say that I can move z's through these tensors, right? So I can start doing this anywhere I want. I can take this z and instead put it here. So what happens is that I deform this string. And now with the same argument, I can of course take two z's and move it to the other side. Right? So I can take these two z's and put them here. And I can keep on doing so, right? That's kind of a bit tedious on the blackboard, but you can see I can keep doing that. I can keep, I can keep deforming the string at will, right? I can move it wherever I want. So there are movable strings in these systems, which I can place, but which, which don't have a well-defined location. They're there. I can't make them go away, but I can push them wherever I want. Mm. So, so why is this exciting? Well, um, one reason why these strings are exciting is because we can use them to parameterize the ground space. So how do we do that? Well, we, we can put the thing on a torus. So let's say this is a whole torus, right? So I imagine periodic boundaries. And now what I can do is I can put one of these string of Zs onto this guy here. I will just draw a string now in red, but it means that at every intersection there's actually a Z sitting on the tensor index. Now, if I put a string like that, what happens? Well, the string could be moved anywhere in the system, but it wraps around the torus in this picture, right? So effectively, what I drew is a string going around the torus, right? So what I know is that following this argument here, I can take the string and move it wherever I want, but I cannot get rid of it, right? So it will affect the state in some way or the other. On the other hand, if you remember how we defined parent time components for these models, what we did was that we said, okay, we take a small block, finite block, and we, we put arbitrary boundary conditions, right? And we look at the reduced density operator of the state in that block. Now, obviously, all this ensures is that the state can be locally be written by just putting a few tensors together with some boundary condition. Now, this still holds here, right? Because the string could be anywhere. I can't assign it a location. So the Hamiltonian here has, in fact, no chance of seeing a string because I could have put the string anywhere, right? It just describes the same state because it's a symmetry. So indeed, I can do this in well, horizontal or vertical direction. So this way, I can parameterize a ground state manifold. Mm. 
which is nice for, for, for many reasons where we, this way we can indeed enumerate the ground state, we can characterize them. We can also find a full parameterization of all possible ground states. So for instance, one can use this to construct things like minimally entangled states. Which are, which are useful to determine topological properties of the system. So these are states which have a, a different entanglement at, uh, across a topologically non-trivial cut. And here one can really get a full parameterization in terms of PEP, so one can get a, a tensor network for the whole manifold. Yes? But did you present any reason why these two states, with one string and with other string, they should be orthogonal? No, and that's actually hard work. Okay. Hmm? <laughs> that was hard work. No, it's, no, indeed, the thing is the following. If, I, if we would take more complicated groups. No, 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 I'm just saying that I could have built the PEPs for, for where, where all these correlations live detached from, from the physical indices. That's a fair point, yes. These, these would not have this injectivity property, right, presumably. Well, these would have more symmetry. If it's completely detached, there must be something else going on, right? If, I mean, if you have a virtual layer which never maps to the physical system, it, it must have a stronger symmetry than just this one. Because it must be complete, it must be completely factorized, right? I imagine a product state, and then exactly. Imagine a physical product state, and the virtual thing is also a product state, like z eigenstates. But if then you have this property, right? If, if these are all zero states, then the virtual system is in the zero state, right? It's invariant under sigma z, but it's also invariant under more things, namely just a single sigma z. So it doesn't have this what I call the injectivity property. But it is hard work, and even if you have this injectivity property, it's not that every different string will give you a different ground state. In the Tori code case, yes? You have to relate that, that these are different states. You can prove it. Let's put this, provably. Um, so what are the precise assumptions when this is orthogonal? Sorry? When are, what are the precise assumptions when this is orthogonal? Uh, well, not orthogonal, linear independent in the first place, right? I mean, it, it kind of depends on the structure of this tensor like how close it's to an isometry or not, if it's actually orthogonal. But I think the basic question is it's linear independent. But I mean, anyway, you, you would get an overparameterization of your ground state manifold, which might still be fine. You might just not care. And I mean, there are cases where this is actually very nice that you can overparameterize and play with some extra parameters. Otherwise, it depends on the group. If the group is a billion, you get exact, exactly, well, each string gives you a different, uh, different ground state. If it's non-abelian, you get less, and this relates to the fact that there is a certain way to count the ground states using irreps of normalizers and such. Non-abelian finite group, right? Non-abelian finite group, yes. Yes? So you're parameterizing with what? With the elements of the group? Sorry, but... So you're parameterizing with what? Well, with, indeed, with elements of the group, right? So, so this string yeah, is labeled group. by... Well, it's I mean, it's good at, it. at, each, at each link, what I have is I have a representation UG sitting say the regular representation for simplicity. And here I also have a representation sitting of a different group H. So in principle, the ground state is parameterized by G and H. Now, if this group is non-abelian, there are some important points. So I said these strings can be moved, right? And that's why they all give ground states. Now, the thing is that if, if these groups are non-abelian, it can happen that the crossing of these strings is tied, OK? So it's actually not sufficient to say that the strings can be moved. I mean, single strings can be moved, but you also want that two strings can be moved. So it means that you can move one, th one string through the other. So what you can kind of see is if, if you do exactly the same argument, but you have two strings, so you would have a second string. So you have, well, let's see. So you have this group element G sitting here, right? And H sitting here, going horizontally. Now, if you try to move this down, what you do is you put H here, H here and so on, right? So you see the string is going like this now, and the string of G is going like that. But you see if G and H, there should be an inverse somewhere, right? I'm being a bit sloppy. Um, but there should be an inverse because they should cancel. Um, you see that H has to commute with G, for instance. Otherwise, you will not be able to pull this thing down. So you get some conditions, right? One condition is that G has to commute with H. And the second condition is that basically because you know that you can just you can just take a single tensor and add an, a new symmetry element, k everywhere, because that's an invariant. And then you can start growing this invariant, and it will kind of code these strings, right? It will keep growing, and at some point it gets stuck at the string. So which means that you can just put this k around all strings everywhere, which means that when you have something labeled by gh, 
this is equivalent to putting another element k around it. Turns out that if you count these equivalence classes, you get exactly what you expect for, for quantum doubles of the corresponding group. Also, the counting there is done in a slightly different way, using right. conjugacy classes and irreps of normalizers. How do you know that you get everything? Sorry? How do you know that you get everything? Well, that's again hard work. I, I don't think I can, I can explain any more than that without preparing. Even with preparing, it would probably take too long, actually. But we can, I'm, I'm very happy to discuss it later. Maybe Yuto will give more details in a more general framework. <laughs> okay, so you two will have to give more details. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It might be worth commenting that the, you know the whole the, the setup is um, is really the same as uh, what you have in uh, in orbifolds and conformal field theory. And this okay. is what preceded the discovery of the structure of quantum doubles. Oh. Okay. So it just came from exactly the same. Oh. At least this part of it is exactly the same thing. Okay. It's all it's basically there's a, just a gauge theory in the line. Mm -hmm. well, there's certainly a close relation to gauge theory. Mm -hmm. um, so, what about the minimally entangled states you would use? Well, like I didn't want to discuss right much about that. It was just kind of a remark on that. I think if they will talk about things like that, if I. No, that is abstract correctly. No, He's doing it for I'm, I'm trying to distribute jobs, right? <laughs> but what do you do when you talk the first day? Yes, what do we talk about it? No, <laughs> so related to this talk. I mean, how much of that carries over to the Gaussian perhaps case? We have the discrete symmetry on the on the kind of covariance matrix level of the Gaussian perhaps. Um, I mean, I can say that for this chiral perhaps indeed. I mean, that's one reason why why I want to talk about this and why we're very excited again about these things is that in, in the chiral case we find some kind of s related similar symmetry. It's not really a product of operators. It's kind of more like a zero momentum. So maybe, how are we doing in time? I have like 15 minutes or? We can also talk about that later. Never mind. Yeah, no, but I mean, like, I can mention it briefly just to kind of make, make the link because otherwise the time will be over and I haven't made the link and I think it would be nice to make the link. So in, in, in the fermionic case, what we see is that we can build a perhaps very similarly. So the way we think about it now is that we say we prepare some initial five per type state with a physical and a virtual system, psi one. And then we apply the projections onto some, some entangling or correlated states. This is kind of a bit, a bit easier because it allows to work with Majorana modes. But the point is that there exists an operator acting on this boundary on a single site, which annihilates the state. And this operator, well, this operator is slightly different, <coughs> like in the simplest case, something C left. So these are Majorana operators now, but it doesn't matter so much. Could be something like that. And what we find is that Again, by projecting onto a pure state of two Majorana operators, say here, this, this symmetry is kind of carried over and grown, and we get a bigger symmetry of the same kind. So indeed, in the end, what we get is we get kind of strings looping around any region, so very similar to what I said here. And again, these strings can be, basically this tells you that one can build strings of that type on the, um, on, 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 on the PEPs and pull it through the system. So these would again allow to say um, parameterize different ground states. And indeed the model we have is also gapless, so there are two ground states. And one thing one can do is for instance to indeed parameterize two different ground states that way. Hmm. So this so this gives a proof that it's gapless. Sorry? You said indeed this the model that you have is gapless, but this is a way to uh, to construct the indeed, this is a way to construct a second the second ground state. States. Well, that, well, indeed, no, no, it depends on. The, I mean, you just you just said they're gapless. So how do you know they're gapless? Well, we know what the Hamiltonian, the corresponding parent Hamiltonian is, and that we know that they have algebraically decaying correlations. The models we have, like we have this one parameter family of model, and we have some other models. But indeed, we know that the corresponding local Hamiltonian is, is gapless. And, but indeed, you know, ha having the symmetry will tell you that probably even if you switch on interactions and you try to keep the symmetry, which might be a good way to try to, to, to make an interactive model out of that, it would probably still be degenerate, but it might not. It might still be gap, right? I mean, it's, I guess for an interactive model, that's very well conceivable that you have two ground states, but then a gap above them. But we don't know. That's 
But you know, given that this symmetry is kind of very closely tied with, with topological order for conventional phases in tensor networks, it feels that this is, is a very interesting observation which might tell us how, how one could, could extend this construction beyond the Gaussian case. And it seems that the symmetry is indeed very closely related to the fact that there are indeed chiral edge modes. So I have to think how I go on. But um, I can also say something about that, or I can stick to normal spin systems, and we can talk about that later, maybe, or at Tarsus poster. Do you discuss this on your poster? Yes, great. <laughs> um, OK, so there, there are a lot of more things which, which come out of these strings. Uh, why should I continue? So, so, so what else can we do with these strings? Well, another thing we can do with these strings, instead of uh, just parameterizing ground states, is we can also put such a string on the lattice. So say a string of these. And then we just stop the string, OK? So the string kind of stops at the plaquette here. The plaquette is indeed special, right? Because we can move this string, again, using the symmetry, to leave the plaquette in this direction. But it will always end at the plaquette. So that's the only one which has an odd number of z's attached to it. And well, it turns out that this is indeed just forms an excitation of the system, right? Because the fact that there's an endpoint of the string, that's something you can observe by putting a Hamiltonian, because you can't just move the string away. The argument was we can move strings away, but we can't move the endpoints. The endpoints are fixed, right? Because there's this odd number of z's at this plaquette. That's a parity constraint. We cannot change that. So it turns out this way you can also model excitations. And for instance, you see these excitations have to come in pairs, right? Because you put, you put a string, it has, it has two endpoints. So indeed, these excitations come in pairs. Um, so it would indeed be interesting in these chiral models to see what happens if one puts such a string in the model and it has an endpoint. Where does it give any kind of excitations? Well, it should. But especially what, what properties these excitations have. If they have any anionic character, or they're just normal fermionic excitations. Yes. Are these elementary excitations? For the toric code, the elementary excitations, magnetic, say. The electric ones are a bit more tricky in this picture. What are elementary excitations? I'm asking whether they are the usual oh, I see. Uh, elementary excitations that are obtained through this construction. Yeah, I think that kind of the lowest line first constructed this way. Sorry? They were even first constructed this way. Well, kind of. Indeed. You put a string well, without peps, but I guess otherwise, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you may not know exactly what I'm referring to. I'll tell you. Probably not. OK. Uh, 1989. Well, that's, that was before my time, I guess. Um, OK. Um, there, there are actually a lot of other things one can understand this way. For instance, randomization transformations. I'm not sure if Yuto will talk about these things in a more general context. But one can basically understand randomization as an effect that there is a unitary which will map tensor products of this representation to a single representation, the tensor identity or something like that. It's, that these representations are actually isomorphic. That relates to the fact that we can renormalize these models so that, well, a block of two sides which has a symmetry of z tensor z is no different than a single block plus something trivial. Mm. Yeah. So these are properties that um, you, are, you are recovering from the PEP description, but they are already present in the toric code, mm -hmm. in analogous to So sure. is this all based on the fact that we have a fixed Conway function, or if you... Not, not really, no. Um, I mean, excitations will always be excitations, but if you go away from the fixed point wave functions, they may be not the elementary excitations, but they will form a basis of, of low-lying states, right? It's, it's not completely evident that this will be exactly the excitation if you go away from the Tory code point. And the thing is that, indeed, at some point, you might even cause a phase transition. So maybe I can spend 10 minutes on that, because I think that's actually quite interesting. What happens if you take these tensors, which have this symmetry, but then you go very far away from a point when, where they're close to an isometry, and it turns out that there, actually, phase transitions can occur. So this whole description, in some sense, breaks down. And, and very funny things happen in some way. Mm, well, I have to decide what I'm going to do because I have more <laughs> notes and less time. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But maybe I will talk about that because I think it fits very nicely and it, I might be able to give an, an idea within 10 minutes. Mm. So, so indeed, one, one of the questions is the following. Indeed, like, like if we asked how much does it depend on the fact that we're at the Tori code point. And in some sense, it doesn't. I mean, the number of ground states and the fact that these describe excitations doesn't depend on that. But the question is, what does that mean? And well, what happens if you, if you go to the thermodynamic limit, for instance? And so let's, let's see if we can modify the tensor in a way which keeps the symmetry but changes its properties. And for this, um, OK, so the point is one can take the Tori code and add what people call string tension. So we had that the Tori code is a superposition of all possible configurations of loops, right? Now we can add string tension or fugacity or whatever one might call it and define a state psi lambda where loops are suppressed, right? So that, that is like tension, right? These loops want to be shorter and they're suppressed by the total length of the loop. So the total length of all loops, right? So Basically, each, each loop segment gives a factor of lambda. It's suppressed by a factor of lambda. And the point is this can be very easily done on the level of the elementary tensors, because what we had originally was that the elementary tensor was just a way to represent a loop on a single square, right? The tensor kind of looked like this. So we can very easily put some lambda here, which has exactly this effect, right? That lambda suppresses having a string. So lambda would be something like a diagonal matrix one lambda tensor four acting on all four sides. Mm. And well, it's actually well known that this model has a phase transition, so one could ask what happens. This model actually has a phase transition going to a trivial phase, which seems to be a bit contradictory with the fact that we have four different ground states, so one might wonder what actually happens at this phase transition. And, okay. I think that. I'm not sure. But it maps to the Ising model, if that's what you want to know. Thank you. <laughs> I, I wouldn't guarantee for that. 0 0.64 or something. This is the value for them, the small physical, right? Yes. But anyway, it's, it's the Ising model, right? I mean, I mean, this is not the Ising model, but you can map it. I mean, you can map its transfer operator, essentially, to the Ising model transfer operator. So you know what the critical point should be. So actually, Castanova and Shaman, I think, were the first to actually study this phase transition and show that, for instance, the topological entropy has a jump exactly at this critical point. Okay, so how much time do I have? Ten minutes? Five? Well, you can add yeah. time. Can <laughs> Where's my chairman? Oh, there's my chairman. Hmm? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. You want to say something about how to understand how to understand the best condition? That was a plan. Is that okay? Or do you have like, other wishes? I, I thought you were telling exactly the time. I'm happy to talk about whatever I am. I'm being asked, as, as long as I can answer it. <laughs> okay, so what, what, what happens at the phase transition? Um, so, so to understand what happens at the phase transition, we have to look what is what is known as a transfer operator. Bruno already used it, but he didn't call it a transfer operator. How did you call it? Double tensor? I'm trying to speak your language. <laughs> Maybe I did not succeed. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so, so let, let, let me try to first draw it in one dimension. So if you have a one-dimensional tensor network, a matrix product state, and we ask, for instance, what is the overlap of two different states or how do correlation functions behave, what we have to compute is we have to take a cat state, a bra state, could be a different state in principle, described by a different tensor B, if we look at, say, overlaps. And then we might put some operator A, A X here and Y here if we want to know a correlation function. And we contract all the legs in between, right? So we see that if the distance is big, basically the important object will be this thing here, which, which mediates the coupling between the left and the right edge. And you can see that kind of the spectral behavior of this guy will be important, because if we take a high power, the leading eigenvalue will remain, and the other ones will be suppressed and give a length scale which relates to the ratio of the eigenvalues. Um, but that's actually not what I want to focus. I want, really want to focus mostly on overlaps of states. So we have this transfer operator T, which could be the correspond to, well, let's label it by A and B, which are the tensors A and B corresponding to the two states. And if we take this on a chain with periodic boundaries, which is long, what will we have? We will have that the overlap of these two states 
is equal to the trace of T A B to the nth power if n is the length of the chain. So this will be roughly gamma A B to the power n, where gamma A B is the largest eigenvalue of this operator T, right? By itself, this doesn't make much sense, but of course what I should do is I should take the normalized um, overlap, right? So in principle, what I want to, to, to look at is something like this. So you see that this will be something like gamma AB divided by gamma AA, gamma BB to the n. So what is important is if this number is one or smaller than one, this will tell me if these states are equal or orthogonal in the one-dimensional case. So, so now what we want to look at is a two-dimensional case. Um, so what happens in the two-dimensional case? Well, in the two-dimensional case, our transfer operator is a bit more complicated. So we're looking at a cylinder, okay? So this state sits on a cylinder. So this guy has periodic boundary conditions. And this is a corresponding two-dimensional transfer operator. So again, if we want to know how different states, say different ground states, which we just wrote down, relate to each other, we have to look at this object. But things are potentially more tricky now. I mean, this quantity is either one or it's smaller than one. And then we take the limit of n to infinity and it goes away or it doesn't. Now, this thing here, again, depends on the other dimension, right? So we have two n's. We have nv, which is this dimension here and we have a length and age. So this power here is an age, but these guys here depend all on NV. So it could be that this thing is not one, but slightly smaller than one, but it goes to one quickly enough to compensate for this exponential suppression. So one has to look more closely in DD4 once to make an assessment about overlaps of states, a relation of states to each other in two dimensions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how does this relate to topological order? So, so the important thing is that, well, again, we have this local symmetry. That, well, each tensor is invariant under the action of Z. Now, this extends to the whole column, right? Because it's stable, so we know that the whole column has this invariance property. So it's invariant under acting with a symmetry action everywhere. And the same is true in the bra layer, not only in the cat layer. So what we have is we have this operator T here. And we find that, well, T commutes if we, I mean, this is equal just to the original thing, right? So we can move this row of these here, and then we get a commutation relation. So we have that T commutes with a symmetry operation even both on the cat and on the bra independently. So what does that mean? It means that, well, T has four different blocks labeled by the irreducible representations of this action of Z, right? So we know that T is a direct sum of T alpha alpha prime, where alpha and alpha prime are plus or minus one, so the irreducible representations of this action of Z. And now, well, and in fact, to be precise, there, there's a second type of transfer operator, namely the one where I put this horizontal string here, right? I could have put this horizontal string and then put the thing on a torus, which means that then I might also have some string Z here and or some string Z here which, well, I can label by phi and phi prime. So this transfer operator has, again, two more blocks labeled by phi and phi prime. And, well, these actually correspond to exactly the four different ground states, whether I have even or odd parity, and whether I put a string or not put a string. And so, so the claim that the important thing is how these... Sorry, you just have the of prime there, but that was not the same thing, right? That's not a symmetry, but it's a possible ground state. So I want to talk about the overlaps of the possible ground. That's, that's what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. okay, so I mean, the aim is to, to, to study basically the transfer operator of the whole ground state manifold. This time, five times should also go to the left hand side of this equation, right? These are different transfer matrices. 
well, but I can I can build a bigger transfer matrix which is which is characterized by. I mean, the principles of the way I think one one might think of it. One shouldn't really program it like that. But you add an extra index. Then. You add just one extra index, which okay. is special. Okay. And this extra index breaks translation invariance of your system in some sense, but it doesn't break it at the physical state, just on the virtual representation. But that's not surprising. I mean, it's there, there's a topological yeah, sector which has some. I mean, this this encodes all possible states now, right? I mean, otherwise it's a bit it's a bit ad hoc to say that this string is different, but projecting with the parity sector is not different. In principle, they are both on pretty much equal footing, right? They both correspond to some type of excitation in your system. Just that this representation is much nicer with respect to one of these these excitations. But in principle, it shouldn't matter. I mean, you can think of it like that, right? Then this is just an extra label. And so, so, so what turns out that exactly the behavior of this transfer operator is what tells you what happens at a phase transition. So if you look, for instance, historical the string tension, what you find is that here is lambda 1, so that's topological. Here is lambda 0, that's trivial. And well, because we know that the transfer operator maps to the Ising model, we, can actually, we actually know what happens. But we can, otherwise, we can do numerics, for instance. And what happens is that something like that happens for the different. So this is the, the largest eigenvalue of each possible sector, alpha phi, alpha phi, phi prime. So the topological regi regime is very simple. What happens is the following, that these guys are one up to exponentially small corrections in NH. Right? For a finite NH, this would have this typical finite size rounding. Um, these guys up here are the ones <coughs> where the cat and the bra index are equal. Which means, whoops, which means that the norm of all the four ground states is equal. And these are all the guys which are off-diagonal, right? So where, where at least alpha prime is not equal to phi prime, to alpha, or phi is not equal to phi prime. So this says that the overlap of these different states vanish in the thermodynamic limit. So these states are actually orthogonal. They describe different ground states. If your system is big enough, this will depend on some kind of, of length scale, right? Which relates to some correlation length in your system. That the phase transition, the situation changes drastically. So what happens is that now the situation is more mixed, actually. So I would have to think how to get the labels right. But what happens physically is the following. So up here, you have four different gammas again. So you have four guys here and four guys here. It's maybe not so surprising because the Ising model is self-dual, right? But they are different. They are labeled by different by, by different ground state labels. And what you will have is that there are two ground states. Let's, let's simplify this and just call this t mu nu prime, where nu goes from 0 to 3, because there are four different states. Now what we'll have is that say that this up here is gamma 0, 0, gamma 0, 1, and gamma 1, 1, and gamma 1, 0. So there are two ground states where the, the overlap matrix element is basically equal to their norm. right? So they become identical in the thermodynamic limit. Which is very surprising. I mean, that's, that's a very unintuitive behavior. Usually, if you have states and you make them bigger, they become more orthogonal. Here, what you have is our states which are linearly independent on any finite volume, but they become more and more close as you make your system bigger. So in effect, there's only one state and not two states. And down here is the whole rest. So what happens is the whole rest, these states, so in particular, there's a guy gamma 2, 2, and gamma 3, 3. So these states have an exponentially small norm, which means that whenever you put the smallest perturbation on them, they will get overlap with that guy. Might still be exponentially small, but because this guy is so much suppressed, they will immediately transform into that state. So they're not stable under perturbations. You can write them down, but they're not stable. So it turns out that indeed at a phase transition, despite having the symmetry, suddenly you can have a phase transition to a trivial phase where actually these four different states only describe one actual state, which one could say is problematic, but one could also say it's very nice because it actually allows us to model topological phase transitions within PEPs by choosing a large enough symmetry, say, which can accommodate different possible topological phases, and then kind of trying to shift, shift the weight within the this, within this subspace, this invariant subspace, such that we can get different, different possible behaviors. OK, I think if there are no questions, I will, I will stop here. <laughs>